my parents me, and my sister was the golden child. But when I inherited $10 million, they demanded $1 million from me for raising me. I found out the truth and sued them. Hey Reddit, I've been reading stories here for a while, and it feels like a lot of people have been through hell, but I've never seen anything quite like what I went through. I'm not even sure how to process it all, but I'll do my best to tell you what happened. Growing up I never really understood why my parents hated me. I mean it wasn't just neglect or indifference, it was full-blown hatred. My name's Mike, by the way, and I'm 28 now, but these memories still haunt me every single day. It all started when I was really young. I have an older sister, Emily. She's two years older than me, and to my parents, she was the golden child. If you looked up golden child in the dictionary, you'd see a picture of her smiling next to our parents. Emily was perfect in their eyes. Straight A's, always polite, pretty, and basically everything they wanted in a kid. Then there was me. From as far back as I can remember, I was the mistake. My parents, Karen and Robert, never let me forget that. They would say it outright sometimes. You are a mistake of our life, my mom would say, usually when I was in trouble for something stupid, like spilling milk or not doing my homework perfectly. Dad would just nod in agreement, like my very existence was a burden they had to carry. I remember one time when I was about six, I was so excited because I'd drawn this picture in school of our family. It wasn't anything special, just stick figures really, but I was proud of it. I showed it to my mom when I got home, and she just stared at it with this look of disgust on her face. Then she crumpled it up right in front of me and tossed it in the trash. Emily can draw much better than this, she said, not even looking at me as she walked away. I cried so hard that day, but no one cared. It was just another reminder that I wasn't good enough. But it wasn't just about the things I did or didn't do. My parents seemed to hate me for existing. They would ignore me most of the time, but when they did pay attention, it was to criticize or punish me. Meanwhile, Emily could do no wrong. She got presents, praise, attention, everything I was starved for. I think the worst part was that Emily knew she was the favorite, and she used it against me. She wasn't just a golden child, she was also a nightmare to live with. When we were little, she would blame me for things she did, like breaking something in the house, and my parents would always believe her without question. Once, when I was about eight, Emily and I were playing in the backyard. We were supposed to be getting along, but she pushed me off the swing. I fell and hit my head pretty hard on a rock. I was crying and bleeding, but when my mom came out and saw what happened, Emily quickly made up some story about how I had been trying to kick her, and she had only pushed me to protect herself. Of course my mom believed her. I got yelled at and sent to my room, and no one even bothered to check if I was okay. I still have a scar on my forehead from that day. It was always like that. Emily was the angel, and I was the devil. It got so bad that I started to believe it. I thought maybe there was something wrong with me, like I really was a bad person who deserved to be treated like that. School wasn't any better. I guess when you're treated like crap at home, it's easy for other kids to pick up on it. I was always the outsider, the weird kid who no one wanted to be friends with. The teachers weren't much help either. My fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Johnson, seemed to have it out for me from day one. She was this old, strict woman who probably shouldn't have been teaching anymore. But there she was, terrorizing kids for a living. She would always call on me to answer questions she knew I didn't know the answers to, just to embarrass me. When I struggled with my work, she would tell me in front of the whole class that I wasn't trying hard enough, or that I was being lazy. I started to hate school as much as I hated being at home. I'll never forget the time when I was nine, and there was this incident that just... Well, it sticks with me, even now. It was during recess, and a group of kids decided they were going to teach me a lesson. I don't even remember what I did to piss them off. Maybe just existing was enough. Anyway, they cornered me behind the school where no teachers were around. There were five of them, led by this kid named Jason who was the class bully. He was bigger than most kids and loved picking on the weaker ones. That day he decided I was his target. They started pushing me around, calling me names, the usual stuff. But then Jason took it further. He grabbed a handful of dirt and rubbed it into my face, laughing the whole time. The other kids joined in, and soon I was on the ground trying to cover my face as they kicked and punched me. I don't know how long it lasted, but it felt like forever. When they finally got bored and left, I was a mess covered in dirt and bruises, my clothes torn. I tried to tell a teacher what happened, but Mrs. Johnson was the one I found, and she just looked at me like I was wasting her time. If you stopped being such a troublemaker, maybe these things wouldn't happen to you, she said, and then sent me back to class. No one was punished, and the next day, it was like nothing had happened. At home, I didn't even bother telling my parents. I knew they wouldn't care. 
In fact, they probably would have blamed me for getting into a fight, even though I never threw a punch. I started to wonder why I was even alive. What was the point of existing if everyone hated me so much I thought about running away? But where would I go? There was no place for me anywhere. The emotional abuse was bad enough. But then things took a darker turn when I turned 10. My dad had always been a heavy drinker, but it seemed like every year, he got worse. He'd come home from work, already half drunk, and would spend the rest of the night downing beer after beer in front of the TV. When he was sober, he mostly ignored me, but when he was drunk, it was like all the hatred he usually kept buried came spilling out. One night, after drinking who knows how many beers, he came into my room. I was trying to do my homework, and I remember being terrified the moment he walked in because he never came into my room unless he was angry about something. He looked at me with this cold, dead stare and said, You're just like your mother. Useless. I didn't know what he was talking about, and before I could even ask, he grabbed me by the arm and yanked me out of my chair. He dragged me down the hall to the kitchen where my mom was sitting, smoking a cigarette. She didn't even look up when we came in. This little shit thinks he's better than us, he slurred. And then, out of nowhere, he slapped me across the face. It wasn't the first time he'd hit me, but this was different. This wasn't just a slap to get me to behave. It was a full-on hit meant to hurt me. I fell to the floor, and my mom just sat there, watching. She didn't say a word, didn't try to stop him. My dad stood over me, yelling about how I was a failure, how I'd never amount to anything, how I was the reason they were miserable. I don't know how long it went on, but by the end of it I was curled up in a ball on the kitchen floor, crying and wishing I could disappear. After that night, things only got worse. My dad started hitting me more often, usually when he was drunk but sometimes even when he was sober. It was like he'd finally found an outlet for all the anger and frustration he'd been carrying around, and I was the target. My mom never stepped in to help. In fact, she seemed to enjoy it, like it was some sick form of entertainment for her. Emily, of course, was completely unaffected by all of this. If anything, she seemed to thrive on the chaos. She'd watch me get beaten and then smirk at me when our parents weren't looking. Sometimes she'd even make up lies to get me in trouble, just to see what would happen. She was manipulative, cruel, and somehow always managed to come out looking like the innocent, perfect daughter. One day, when I was about eleven, Emily did something that I'll never forget. We were home alone after school, and she was sitting in the living room, flipping through channels on the TV. I was in the kitchen, trying to finish my homework before my parents got home, because I knew if I didn't have it done, there would be hell to pay. Emily called out to me, asking me to come to the living room, and I knew from the tone of her voice that she was up to something. When I walked into the room, she had this strange, almost excited look on her face. She told me to sit down, so I did, though I was wary of what she had planned. She pulled out a small box from under the couch and handed it to me. I opened it, and inside was a dead bird. It looked like it had been killed recently, and there was blood on the feathers. I stared at it, horrified, and asked her where she got it. She just smiled and said, I found it outside. Thought you might like it. I didn't know what to say. I was disgusted, but also terrified of what she might do next. I tried to give the box back to her, but she wouldn't take it. You have to keep it, she insisted. It's a gift. Then she leaned in close and whispered, If you tell anyone about this, it'll make sure mom and dad find out what you did to it. I was so scared that I just nodded and took the box back to my room. I didn't know what to do with it, so I hid it under my bed. For days I was paranoid that my parents would find it and blame me for killing the bird. I was living in constant fear, not just of my parents, but of my own sister. She had become this twisted version of the person I used to look up to, and I didn't know how to deal with it. The final straw came when I was twelve. By then, the abuse from my dad had become almost a daily occurrence, and I was so beaten down physically and emotionally that I could barely function. I had started having nightmares, waking up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat, terrified that my dad was going to come into my room and beat me again. My grades were slipping, and I was getting into trouble at school because I just couldn't focus. I was in such a dark place that I didn't see any way out. One night, after another beating from my dad, I was lying in bed, crying and feeling completely hopeless. That's when I decided I couldn't take it anymore. I didn't want to live in that house, in that life, for one more day. I thought about running away, but I knew they'd find me. So instead, I decided I was going to end it. I didn't have any pills or anything like that, so I took a rope from the garage and tied it to the beam in my closet. I was ready to do it. I was so ready to end the pain. But just as I was about to step off the chair, something stopped me. 
It wasn't some profound realization or anything like that. It was fear. The same fear that had kept me alive all those years. I didn't want to die, I just didn't want to live like that anymore. So I untied the rope and collapsed on the floor, crying until I couldn't cry anymore. The next day I went to school like nothing had happened, but inside I was broken. I didn't know how to fix myself, and I didn't know if I even wanted to try. All I knew was that I couldn't keep living like this, but I had no idea what to do. I don't know who I am, and I don't know how to figure it out. All I know is that I'm tired of being angry, tired of being scared, and tired of feeling like I'm not worth anything. Update. Hey Reddit, it's been a while since I posted here, and a lot has happened since then. I've had some time to reflect on my life, and I think I need to share what's been going on, if only to get it out of my head. I'm the guy who grew up in a nightmare of a family, where my parents hated me, my sister tormented me, and the abuse left me so broken that I didn't know if I'd ever be okay. But here's the thing I managed to pull myself out of that hellhole. I'm successful now, by most people's standards, but I still feel like there's something missing. Maybe you guys can help me figure out what that is. After everything that happened when I was a kid, I reached a point where I knew I had to do something drastic to change my life. That moment came in the form of one last, shocking event, something that finally pushed me to take control of my life. I had just turned 14, and things at home were worse than ever. My dad's drinking had escalated to the point where he was hardly ever sober, and the beatings had become a regular occurrence. My mom was still her cold, indifferent self, and Emily was as cruel as ever. I was barely hanging on, just trying to survive each day. One night I was in my room, trying to focus on my homework, when I heard my parents arguing downstairs. It wasn't anything new, they fought all the time, but this time, it was different. The shouting got louder and more intense, and I could hear things being thrown around. Then suddenly there was a loud crash, followed by silence. I was terrified, but something told me I needed to see what was happening. I crept out of my room and down the stairs, trying to be as quiet as possible. When I reached the bottom of the stairs, I saw my dad lying on the floor in the living room, surrounded by broken glass and overturned furniture. My mom was standing over him, holding a broken bottle in her hand, and she was screaming at him to get up but he wasn't moving. He was just lying there, completely still. I was frozen in place, not knowing what to do. My mom turned and saw me standing there, and for a moment, there was a look of pure hatred in her eyes. Then she dropped the bottle and walked out of the room, leaving me alone with my dad's unconscious body. I don't know how long I stood there, but eventually, I forced myself to move. I knelt down next to my dad, and I could see that he was still breathing, but barely. I didn't know what to do, should I call an ambulance? Should I just leave him there? Part of me wanted to run away and never look back, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. In the end, I called 911 and told them what had happened. The paramedics came and took him to the hospital, and my mom didn't say a word as they carried him out of the house. After that night, everything changed. My dad was in the hospital for a while, and when he finally came home, he was a different person. He was quieter, more subdued, and he didn't drink as much but the damage had already been done. I knew I couldn't stay in that house any longer, not if I wanted to survive. So I made a decision. I was going to do whatever it took to get out of there and build a life for myself, away from the people who had destroyed my childhood. I threw myself into my schoolwork with a new determination. I had always been pretty good at math, but now I made it my mission to become the best. I studied day and night, pushing myself harder than I ever had before. My grades started to improve. And for the first time in my life, I felt like I had some control over my future. I knew that if I could excel in math, it would open doors for me doors that would lead me far away from my family. My teachers started to notice the change in me. I went from being the quiet, withdrawn kid who barely passed his classes to the top student in math. My math teacher, Mr. Thompson, was the first person who really believed in me. He saw that I had potential, and he encouraged me to apply for scholarships and programs that could help me go to college. I hadn't even considered college before my parents certainly weren't going to pay for it, but now it became my goal. I was going to get into a good university, and I was going to do it on my own terms. By the time I was a senior in high school, I had a 4.0 GPA and had been accepted into a top university on a full scholarship. I was going to study finance, a field where I could use my math skills to build a successful career. My parents barely acknowledged my achievement. They were too wrapped up in their own misery to care about what I was doing. Emily who was still the perfect daughter in their eyes, was heading to a different university, and she made sure to remind me that she was still the favorite. But I didn't care anymore. I was leaving, and that was all that mattered. 
When I finally moved out and started college, it felt like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders. I was free from my family, free from the abuse, and free to start a new life. I threw myself into my studies with everything I had. I was determined to prove to myself that I was worth something, that I could be successful despite everything I'd been through. I spent countless hours in the library, poring over textbooks and working on assignments until late at night. My hard work paid off I was at the top of my class, and I earned every accolade that came my way. But even as I excelled in my studies, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was missing. I had friends in college, but I kept them at a distance. I didn't trust anyone enough to let them get close to me. I was too afraid of being hurt again. Instead, I focused on my grades and my future career. I had a plan, and I wasn't going to let anything or anyone get in the way of that. After graduating with honors, I landed a job at a promising finance company. It was everything I had worked for, good pay, a prestigious position, and the chance to climb the corporate ladder. I threw myself into my work with the same determination that had gotten me through college. I worked long hours, took on extra projects, and made sure that I was the best at what I did. My bosses took notice, and my career started to take off. Within a few years, I was promoted to a senior position, and my salary had doubled. I was living in a nice apartment in the city, driving a car that I never could have afforded before, and wearing expensive suits to work every day. By all accounts, I was living the dream. But the more successful I became, the more I realized that success didn't fill the void inside me. No matter how much money I made or how high I climbed in my career, I still felt empty. I had cut off all contact with my family after I left for college. I didn't call, didn't visit, and didn't even acknowledge them on holidays. As far as I was concerned, they didn't exist. But the truth is, their absence in my life left a hole that I didn't know how to fill. I had spent so many years trying to prove to myself that I was worth something, that I hadn't stopped to think about what I really wanted. My life had become all about work and success, and I didn't know how to live any other way. There was one night in particular that stands out to me. I had just closed a huge deal at work, one that was going to make the company a lot of money and earn me a big bonus. I should have been ecstatic, but instead, I felt nothing. I came home to my empty apartment, sat down on the couch, and just stared at the wall. It hit me then, despite everything I had accomplished. I was still that scared, lonely kid who just wanted someone to care about him. I started to wonder if I had made a mistake by cutting off my family completely. They had hurt me in ways that I still can't fully understand, but they were still my family. I thought about reaching out to them, maybe just to see if they had changed or if they even cared that I was gone. But every time I picked up the phone, I couldn't do it. The fear and anger I felt were too strong. I couldn't forgive them for what they had done, and I wasn't sure I ever would. So I kept going, burying myself in my work and trying to ignore the growing emptiness inside me. I told myself that if I just kept working hard, if I just kept climbing the ladder, eventually I would find happiness. But deep down, I knew that wasn't true. Success wasn't the answer to my problems. It was just a way to distract myself from the pain. Now, here I am, 28 years old and more successful than I ever imagined I would be. But I'm also more lost than ever. I don't know who I am or what I really want out of life. I've built this career that I'm proud of, but it doesn't make me happy. I don't have any close friends, and I've never been in a serious relationship because I'm too scared of getting hurt. I've spent so long running from my past that I don't know how to face it, and it's tearing me apart. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I'm not okay, even though it looks like I should be. I don't know how to fix the emptiness inside me, and I'm starting to wonder if I ever will. I've tried therapy, but it hasn't helped much. I still wake up every day feeling like I'm just going through the motions, like I'm living someone else's life. So I am here, asking for advice. Has anyone else been through something like this? How do you move on from a past that haunts you? How do you find happiness when you've spent your whole life feeling like you don't deserve it? I don't know what to do anymore, and I'm afraid that if I don't figure it out soon, I'm going to lose everything I've worked so hard for. Final update, I'm back again, and this time, I've got some pretty crazy stuff to share. If you've read my previous posts, you know that my life has been a roller coaster of trauma, success, and emptiness. But recently, things have taken a turn that I never saw coming. I've been through so much, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around everything that's happened. I'm not sure where to even start, but I guess the best place is at the beginning, when I finally decided to get serious about therapy. After my last post, I realized that I couldn't keep going the way I was. I was successful on the outside, but inside I was falling apart. I knew I needed help, 
so I found a therapist who specialized in trauma and childhood abuse. Her name is Dr. Evelyn Carter, and from the moment I met her, I felt like maybe just maybe I could finally start to heal. Therapy was hard. I won't sugarcoat it. There were days when I would leave Dr. Carter's office feeling like I'd been hit by a truck. She made me confront things it buried so deep that I didn't even know they were there. We talked about my parents, about the abuse, about the anger and fear that had been controlling my life for so long. It wasn't easy, but little by little I started to feel like I was making progress. Dr. Carter encouraged me to find something outside of work that brought me joy, something that wasn't tied to my past or my trauma. She said I needed a hobby, something that would help me reconnect with myself. At first I had no idea what that could be. I'd spent so many years focused on my career that I didn't know what I even liked to do anymore. But after some trial and error, I found something that clicked I started painting. Now, I'm no artist, but there was something therapeutic about putting brush to canvas. It was like I could take all the emotions that had been swirling around inside me and pour them out in colors and shapes. I didn't care if the paintings were good or not. It wasn't about that. It was about finally having a way to express myself, to let go of some of the pain I'd been carrying for so long. For the first time in years, I started to feel like I was reclaiming a part of myself. I wasn't just the successful financier with a traumatic past. I was Mike the guy who liked to paint, who was trying to heal, who was learning to live for himself and not just for his career. It wasn't a perfect process, but it was a start. Then, out of nowhere, something happened that turned my world upside down. I received a letter from a law firm in London, one that I'd never heard of before. The letter was brief and formal, stating that I had been named the beneficiary in the will of someone named William Hargrave. The name didn't ring any bells, and at first I thought it was some kind of scam. But as I read further, I realized that this was real. The letter went on to explain that Mr. Hargrave had left me an inheritance of ten million. I was stunned. Who was this William Hargrave? Why had he left me such an enormous amount of money I had no idea who he was, and there was no explanation in the letter? Just the contact information for the law firm, and instructions on how to claim the inheritance. I didn't know what to do. I mean ten million that's life-changing money. But I was also deeply suspicious. I had no idea who this man was, and I wasn't about to just take the money without knowing more. So, I contacted the law firm, and after a few days of back-and-forth emails and phone calls, I was on a plane to London to meet with the lawyers in person. When I arrived at the law firm, I was greeted by a lawyer named James Bradford. He was a middle-aged man with graying hair and a non-nonsense demeanor. He led me into a conference room, where we sat down, and he explained everything to me. William Hargrave, it turned out, was a wealthy businessman who had lived in London for most of his life. He had made his fortune in real estate and investments, and he had never married or had children. According to Mr. Bradford, Mr. Hargrave had always been a private man, and he had few close friends. But he had left behind detailed instructions in his will, naming me as the sole beneficiary of his estate. I was even more confused. Why me, I had never met this man in my life. But then Mr. Bradford dropped a bombshell William Hargrave was my biological father. I felt like the ground had been pulled out from under me. My biological father. How could that be I had never even suspected that I was adopted? My parents had never mentioned anything, and I had no reason to doubt that they were my real parents. But here was undeniable proof legal documents, birth certificates, adoption papers. It was all there in black and white. According to the documents, I had been born in London, and my biological mother had died shortly after giving birth. William Hargrave, my biological father, had been unable to care for me at the time, so he had arranged for me to be adopted by my parents, Karen and Robert, when I was just a few months old. They had agreed to never tell me the truth, and until now, they had kept that promise. I didn't know how to feel. Angry, betrayed, confused. It was like my whole life had been a lie, and I didn't know who I was anymore. But at the same time, there was this strange sense of relief. Maybe this explained why my parents had always treated me the way they did. Maybe, deep down, they had never really seen me as their son. I had always felt like an outsider in my own family, and now I knew why. Mr. Bradford handed me the adoption papers, along with a letter from William Hargrave. It was short, just a few lines, but it said everything I needed to know. He had always regretted giving me up, but he believed it was the best thing for me at the time. He had followed my life from afar, through the reports he received from my adoptive parents. He knew about the abuse, about the struggles I had faced, and he had wanted to help me, but he hadn't known how. The inheritance was his way of making amends, of giving me the life he had always wanted for me. I didn't know how to process all of this. I left the law firm in a daze, walking through the streets of London with no destination in mind. 
My entire life had just been turned upside down, and I had no idea what to do next. But one thing was clear I needed to confront my parents. I needed to know why they had kept this from me, why they had treated me the way they did, and what they had to say for themselves now that the truth was out. When I got back to the States, I made the decision to visit my parents. It was the first time I had seen them in years, and I was filled with a mix of anger and dread as I drove up to the house I had once called home. The house looked the same, but I felt like a stranger as I walked up to the front door. My mom answered the door, and she looked shocked to see me. My dad was sitting in his usual spot on the couch, a beer in his hand, and Emily was there too, scrolling through her phone. They all looked up as I walked in, and there was an awkward silence as they waited for me to speak. I didn't waste any time. I told them everything I had learned in London about William Hargrave, about the adoption, about the inheritance. My mom's face went pale, and my dad's expression turned hard. Emily just stared at me, a look of disbelief on her face. I could see the wheels turning in their heads trying to figure out how to respond. Finally my dad spoke. He demanded to know how much money I had inherited. I didn't answer him right away, but he kept pressing me, getting angrier and more insistent. My mom stayed silent, but I could see the greed in her eyes. They didn't care about the truth, about the fact that they had lied to me my entire life. All they cared about was the money. When I told them it was ten million, my dad's eyes lit up, and he immediately demanded that I give them one million for raising me. He said it was the least I could do, after everything they had done for me. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. After all the abuse, all the neglect, they had the audacity to demand money from me. I told them no. I told them that they didn't deserve a single penny, not after the way they had treated me. My dad's face twisted with rage, and he stood up, clenching his fists. My mom started crying, playing the victim, and Emily just watched, a cold smile on her face. I could see the hatred in their eyes, and I knew that they were never going to let this go. I left the house, slamming the door behind me, but I wasn't prepared for what happened next. As I was walking to my car, I heard footsteps behind me. Before I could turn around, I felt a sharp pain in my side, and I realized that Emily had hit me with something a folding stick. The pain was excruciating, and I fell to the ground, clutching my side. My dad was there too, and he started kicking me, screaming that I was an ungrateful bastard. I tried to protect myself, but they were relentless. Emily kept hitting me with the stick, and I could feel my ribs crack under the pressure. I thought they were going to kill me. Somehow, I managed to crawl away and get to my car. I was in so much pain that I could barely see straight, but I knew I had to get out of there. I drove to the hospital, barely making it, and when I got there, the doctors told me that I had multiple broken ribs and internal bleeding. They kept me in the hospital for several days, and I had to have surgery to repair the damage. While I was in the hospital, I contacted a lawyer named Rebecca Price. She was a tough, non-nonsense woman who specialized in cases involving family violence. I told her everything that had happened. She also helped me file assault charges against them. The legal process was long and grueling. My parents hired a lawyer of their own, trying to paint me as the aggressor, but Rebecca was relentless. She gathered evidence, including my medical records and witness statements from the hospital staff, and she made sure that the truth came out. In the end, my dad and Emily were convicted of assault and sentenced to prison time. It wasn't as long as I had hoped, but it was something. I knew that they would never be able to hurt me again. The judge Helen Morris was stern but fair. She told me that I had done the right thing by standing up for myself, and she urged me to continue with therapy to heal from the trauma I had experienced. I was grateful for her words, but I knew that my journey was far from over. Now, Im left trying to pick up the pieces of my life. I've inherited a fortune, but I've lost what little family I had left. I'm still in therapy, trying to come to terms with everything that's happened, and I'm trying to figure out who I am now that the truth is out. I've reconnected with Dr. Carter, and we're working through the trauma of the attack, as well as the revelations about my adoption. I don't know what the future holds for me, but I'm determined to keep moving forward. I've been through hell, but I've survived. Now I need to find a way to truly live, to find peace and happiness in a life that's been filled with so much pain.